our first speaker today is Sophia Bachman, and the title of her capstone project is Nationalism, Glasnost, and Conflict in Georgia over the Fall of the USSR. Thank you. Um, so, uh, my main research question is how did nationalism, conflict, and glasnost in Georgia interact and support each other in the late 1980s and early 1990s? My hypothesis is that glasnost in the mid-1980s allowed rising Georgian, Abkhaz, and South Ossetian nationalism to grow into armed conflict. And so, before we begin, it's important to define a few terms. For, um, first, let's start with nationalism. Nationalism I look at as pride in one's country that goes beyond patriotism and of course leads to negative consequences. I worked with Ernest Gellner's definition of nationalistic sentiment that it is the feeling of anger aroused by the violation of political principles. However, in the Georgian Abkhaz South Ossetian case, this goes actually much deeper to anger at the perceived violation of national ideals. Um, that is of language, territory, and culture. Um, so now let's take a look at Glasnost. Glasnost was enacted by Gorbachev um, when he was in power from uh, 1985 to 1991. And this policy was made possible by Andropov's ruthless cleansing of corruption prior to Gorbachev in, um, from 1982 to 1984. Um, so this policy was Gorbachev's incremental implementation of allowing dissident opinions in the public sphere to blossom. And so this policy kind of opened up the floodgates of dissatisfaction and nationalism within Georgia. So while we look at why the advent of glasnost um, led to a rise in nationalism and then conflict, it is of, of course necessary to look at a brief historical background to understand why these conflicts came to be. So um, although conflict in South Ossetia is fairly recent, that is perhaps within the past couple hundred uh, years or so, and it is of course, um, or did not start out as intense as the conflict in Abkhazia um, was, um, conflict in Abkhazia and Georgia itself can be traced back um, many years, actually thousands of years. Um, so let's look at the early 100 CE first. Um, we see that the area of Georgia around the Black Sea was a center of conflict between the Persian and Roman empires, and then between Persia and Byzantium. Georgian tribes had to constantly fight for their land and for control of their region, and they were often under the control of a stronger power. The tribes remained intact due to a high level of importance placed on culture, language preservation, as well as orthodoxy. Um, by early CE as well, Abkhaz tribes, also known as the Apsua, were well established in the South Caucasus. Um, okay, so jumping ahead to the 1200s, the Mongols invade, and in this instance, both the Abkhaz and the Georgians fought against the Mongols together. And so we, we, in their past, we see not only fighting against each other between the Abkhaz and Georgians, but uh, fighting against a common enemy as well. When the Ottoman Empire failed to gain control of the region and the Persians took over, the Georgians and Abkhaz again fought against them as well. The Meteki Bridge in Tbilisi is called the Bridge of 100,000 Martyrs um, due to the Persians slaughtering those who refused to denounce Christianity in the 13th century. And so here we see a long remembrance of history as well as any affronts towards Orthodoxy or Christianity. Um, and so over the years, uh, regional control traded back and forth between the Abkhaz and the Georgians. In the 1600s, we now see the advent of most of Ossetians to the region, to South Ossetia. And soon after, we see them being incorporated into the Russian Empire. In the early 18th century, again, Russia and Georgia allied against the Persians. However, once Abkhazia and Georgia were encompassed into the Russian Empire as well, the land was used as a pawn while the Russian Empire fought against the Ottomans. Um, and in the late 1800s arises the idea in Georgian society as the Abkhaz being newcomers to the land um, and not inherently belonging to the territory. So now let's again jump ahead to 1917. The Russian Empire collapses and Georgia uh, receives its independence. So this um, lasts until the Bolsheviks drive out the Menshevik government in 1921. Then we have Stalin keeping North and, Seti and South Ossetia separate 
uh, despite their unification of being Ossetian, to undermine nationalism, especially Georgian nationalism, something that he greatly feared. However, we also have the conflicting policy of Karinizatsia going on at the time, which supported the, uh, the single nationality, supposedly, of the various republics of the Soviet Union. So we see that at the same time as everyone's being told that you are all Soviets, you are, are equal, we're having a, an emphasis of nationalism, however inadvertent, and therefore an emphasis of economic tensions that were growing between the Georgians and South Ossetians and then the Abkhaz as well. And so it, this also allowed for tensions to grow between Georgia and the Soviet government in Moscow well, when Stalin slowly decreased Georgia's autonomy as well as decreasing the powers of the minority regions within Georgia itself. So prior to Stalin's great terror of the 1930s, the seeds of nationalism had already been planted in Georgia, and discontent between Moscow, Tbilisi, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia remained until their chance to um, come forth with Glasnost. So now let's look at the 1970s. We have Brezhnev in Moscow till 82, and we have Shevardnadze, Edward Shevardnadze, leading Georgia until 1985. During this period of the 70s, we're kind of seeing nationalism start to come to a rise, so it sets the stage for when Glasnost opens the floodgates. And this nationalism rose um, with the person of Zviad Gamsa Khurdia and the extremist version of nationalism that he was touting as Georgia for Georgians and minorities as guests and not belonging to the land in Georgia. In 1977, we see the latest Abkhaz letter to Brezhnev asking to secede from Georgia and join Russia. I say latest because in 1954 the Abkhaz also wrote a letter asking to secede. Um, interesting fact, the South Ossetians in 1925 once wrote to Stalin to ask him to become one with North Ossetia, however um, this was ignored and then they did not, there was really not the same level of unrest until they react to the tension going on in the 80s between Abkhazia and Tbilisi. And so going back to 1977 and the Abkhaz letter, this was largely ignored. However, Moscow did urge Tbilisi to back off in their Georgia for Georgians campaign. And so as a result, the Abkhaz State University in Sukhumi was created with some classes in Abkhaz language. And this kind of showed how um, Georgia and Tbilisi was supporting uh, a minority language and culture and saying, however grudgingly, that yes, you do matter and this is important. And of course, because of rising nationalism in Tbilisi, this did cause answering protests in Tbilisi um, by ethnic Georgians. So now we've reached the 1980s. Most of the discontent at this point is in Abkhazia, okay? Although South Ossetia was also becoming increasingly dissatisfied with policies of Georgianization, that is, um, movement against minority languages and cultures and teaching about them in schools as well. In the early 1980s, we see a cultural repercussion of Glasnost in the personification of Tengiz Abeladze, a famous Georgian director, and his film Repentance. This film condemned Sovietization, condemned Stalin's cult of personality, a native son of Georgia, which was a radical move, and it also showed Georgia as under Soviet oppression and occupation. And so this was a very shocking film at the time. So this film, while it was started in maybe even the late 70s, early 80s, um, there were a couple bumps in the road. First of all, the main, one of the actors who played one of the main characters, he was executed in 1984 for being a terrorist um, because he attempted to hijack a plane to escape the Soviet Union. And so we kind of see repercussions of leading up to glasness of um, westernizing and et cetera in Georgia. Um, however, um, so then we see gl uh, Glasnost brought by Gorbachev and finally Shevardnadze is able to lobby on the film's behalf with Gorbachev and in 1987 the film is shown briefly in the USSR and it premieres in Cannes internationally in 1987. Um, so this film demonstrates Georgian sentiments towards language, territory, culture, as well as the closeness they felt towards orthodoxy. And it also demonstrates the antipathy that Georgians held for those who attempted to suppress any of those ideals. This film was made possible directly through Glasnost because 
Um, it reflected the Georgian feeling and need to protect and defend Georgians for Georgians, and it was showing very strong sentiment, and it was quite radical for the time period and would not have been possible had not the arena opened up for the possibility of being able to show public a discord or disagreement with the Soviet past. So demonstrations at this time period are continuing in Tbilisi to maintain Georgian sovereignty. There's also anger at Moscow, at the Soviet government, for repression of the Republic. And there's also direct anger towards the Abkhaz and their sentiments to join um, Russia or secede from Georgia, rather. And eventually these protests will also towards turn um, against the South Ossetians. So there are de demonstrations in Sukhumi for full autonomy, the Abkhaz capital. And in 1988, there's another Abkhaz letter to Gorbachev asking to secede again, which is largely ignored. Um, so at this time, South Ossetian and Abkhaz autonomy are still being decreased by Tbilisi. Only Georgian language and culture is supp supported both publicly and politically. Glasnost is spreading through the elites and intellectuals, and now it's becoming, it's starting to emerge through the regular population, and disagreements are becoming more and more outspoken. Public dissidence is more possible, so both conflict and nationalism are allowed to, uh, are allowed to rise in this more open arena. So enter Jumber Patiashvili. He was the head of Georgia from 1985 to 1989. Originally, he tried to stop, or slow down at least, glassness, but was unable. And through some other negative policies, he ended up alienating the Georgian people. Um, the negativeness, negativity of his rule really culminated in, on 9 April 1989. So after a few days of protests in Tbilisi against the latest request for secession by Abkhazia and for Georgian independence at this point from the Soviet Union, um, and our nationalist Zviad Gamsakhurdia was present, Patiashvili finally called in Soviet troops to quash the demonstrators, and many were killed and even more were injured. And so this date lives in infamy in the Georgian mind. Um, following this, armed conflict eventually erupted in Sukhumi. Why? Well, um, due to rising Georgian nationalism, remember that Abkhaz State University was created in Sukhumi to support Abkhaz language and culture. And at this point, Georgian students had been complaining of marginalization by Georgian other, or other Abkhaz students and Abkhaz teachers. And so finally, legislation went through in Tbilisi that said that Abkhaz State University would become a branch of Tbilisi State University. And so back and forth protests finally raised into conflict um, after months and months of demonstrations in the summer. Many Georgians rallied to fight and Soviet soldiers had to organize a ceasefire. However, this did not stop the issues because under Gorbachev, republics gained more legislative power and so the discord was able to continue because Tbilisi still had control um, over Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and minorities in the country. Um, so at this point, we're going to see the rise of South Ossetian nationalism and calls for further autonomy, although not outright secession yet. Enter the 1990s. In 1990, our nationalist Zviad Gamsakhurdia, we see him again, he becomes head of Georgia for about two years. And he reiterates that minorities are guests in Georgia and should not enjoy equal rights as Georgians because if they're not going to vote for Georgian independence, then they should not have voting rights, they should not have land rights, citizenship rights. So as a response, of course, this did not go over well. In 25 August 1990, Abkhazia declared independence from Georgia. On 11 December of that year, South Ossetia professed its allegiance to the USSR and not towards Georgia. And so we see them being drawn into the conflict and being affected by these rising nationalisms. 9 April 1991, two years to the day of the horrible events of 1989, Georgia declared independence from the USSR. Armed conflict as a response erupted in South Ossetia this time, and Soviet troops again brokered a ceasefire, which was uneasy at best until uh, 2003, the Rose Revolution. And jumping ahead to look at the future for a moment, in 2008, Russia finally recognized Abkhazia and South Ossetia and supported their independence from Georgia with troops. And so we can kind of look at the events we're about to discuss in the 1990s as perhaps a practice round for Russia. So, Going back to our, our upheaval of 1991, we see the fall of the USSR, 
we see Gorbachev ousted for Yeltsin, and as well as the chaos going on with as well Piristroika in Moscow, and the lack of control that they, the lack of the amount of regular level of control that they had over the smaller republics, we're also seeing upheaval in Georgia when Shevardnadze takes over after the brief nationalistic rule of Kitovani and Yoseliani, and Eduard Shevardnadze uh, again. And so we're seeing a continuation of separatist rhetoric in South Abkhazia, and in South Ossetia, I apologize, and <laughs> Abkhazia with Vladislav Ardzinba, nationalist leader. Um, and so in July of 92, Abkhazia again declared independence, this time from an independent Georgia. And armed conflict broke out between Abkhazia and Georgia. Russia brokered the ceasefire in 93, however, um, the events leading up to the ceasefire were full of upheaval. Um, so what occurred was uh, Abkhazia attempted to ethnically cleanse the region of, uh, let's say, politically and publicly prominent Georgians, and Georgian troops entered the region and uh, ostensibly to um, rescue a politician. However, they ended up open firing and then they took um, Sukhumi, the capital, and took most of Abkhazia. In this case, we're seeing Russian troops now openly backing a minority because they supported Abkhaz troops to take back Sukhumi and most of Abkhazia. So Russia then used this treaty that they brokered in 93 as a reason for constant, a constant Russian military base and troops presence. So by 1993, Abkhazia and South Ossetia have de facto separation from Georgia. And today the issues have simply been exacerbated over time, the complicating factor being the constant Russian presence. And so it is incredibly necessary to look at the roots of Abkhaz, South Ossetian, and Georgian nationalism in order to understand why these conflicts still persist to this day. So we see that all sides have similar goals, language, culture, territorial preservation. And the conflicts have evolved into the loss of the conflict, meaning a loss of cultural identity. It's no longer just losing a fight, it's losing who you are. And so we're also seeing a war of historical narratives, in that who came to Georgia first, and who equals who has most traditional rights to the territory. And now that Russian troops are in Georgia, any Western peace builders are seen as aggressive Western action for regional propaganda, not as assistance for finding solutions to the many difficulties that plague the Caucasus. Russia's invasion of Georgia is not the main issue, however, but rather a symptom of the disagreements brought on by three competing nationalisms. Therefore, by examining how glasnost fueled the spike in nationalism and conflict in the 80s, it is possible to gain a closer understanding of the roots of the issues in Georgia and be able to approach solutions for the future with perhaps greater success or at least greater understanding. Thank you. Thank you. We packed a lot in there. <laughs> Questions, comments? Um, so I really enjoyed, or I really like that you uh, integrated the Repentance movie in there because that's a really fascinating one. Um, but I just would like you to clarify, because maybe I didn't catch it, like how exactly did the themes in that movie add to um, ethnic conflict, if that was what you were arguing? Because I don't really remember there being necessarily like ethnic minority tones in that movie, per se. Yeah. Well, I don't think that they added to ethnic conflict. I think they rather uh, supported reflected rather the rising Georgian nationalism at that time because this film demonstrated the things that were closest to Georgian and it did so to Georgians and it did so in a radical way by kind of looking at Stalin or a Stalin-like character in a negative light which I think was radical for the time period and so it kind of showed that things that were not possible before were becoming possible and this I think reflected the nationalist sentiment that these things are so close to Georgians and if someone even comes close to uh, trying to suppress any of these ideals then they will be met with an extreme response that wasn't possible beforehand. So I simply, I tried to introduce it as a reflection of the time period. Sure, yeah. Sophia, that was really, really interesting. Um, my two quick questions are historic or historical in nature. I guess one I really like the fact that you provided such deep historical background for everything. Um, North and South Ossetia, 
when and how did they become split? Um, I know there's, there's huge mountains uh, in between the two, but I'm just kind of curious as to how that, how that happened and why that happened. And the other question has to do with the, uh, you mentioned several, several times, I think in 54, 77, 88, uh, mm -hmm. It's interesting, 54, the first time, the year after Stalin's death, that the Abhaz wrote the, tried to uh, secede, uh, wrote the letter to Moscow to try to secede. Um, do you think that the, the Soviet, uh, Moscow's refusal uh, to uh, allow them to secede had to do with concerns about the repercussions that it would have uh, in larger Georgia itself, or more so that, um, and they could be mutually, these are not mutually exclusive explanations, I suppose, that having Abkhazia as part of Georgia is a was a lever of Moscow uh, to um, kind of contest Georgian nationalism. Excuse me, sorry. Thank you. Um, so the North Ossetian South Ossetian split. Um, so I do know I can refer to Stalin and the fact that he kept them apart. However, when this first happened, I do not know a specific date, mm -hmm. um, but I will note that to find out. Because presumably um, during the Russian but, Empire, it was all just part of right. a, the same gubernia. I don't right. know, I guess one could check that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I've searched yeah. for a specific date. Yeah, it just kind of pu pu puzzled, puzzled me as an yeah. explanation. Yeah. Anyway. Right, exactly. And so I know that he did keep them apart. Um, and then use this to kind of undermine their nationalism and um, just ignore requests and use it to undermine the Georgian state overall. However, I will find out more details about that. Thank you. Um, your second question about um, Abkhaz secession in Georgia, um, whether your question was whether the reper repercussions in... Well, Mos Moscow refused several several times to do, to do, to do this. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, and I guess the question is why. Well, I think that I, I think that your second point is the accurate is is that it, it's a lever for Moscow to use to undermine control in Georgia as a whole. And so when Georgia is destabilized, then it is um, it is more uh, what's that word? Um, well, it's more open to Moscow's influence and vulnerable. weaker, vulnerable. vulnerable. Thank you. <laughs> yes, exactly. I guess on the uh, linguistic side, because you did mention briefly um, the importance of linguistics difference in these uh, two particular regions, uh, territories, um, that, okay, <laughs> I was just wondering, um, was there any point in the history of Abkhazia and South Ossetia mm -hmm. where uh, Ossetian and um, Abkhaz as languages were recognized in any official capacity, um, and what sort of was the, uh, if if not, or if so, what were the repercussions for um, nationalist sentiment? I mean, I highly doubt that through the Russian Empire they were recognized, and through the Soviet times they were certainly not recognized. Um, and I think this just served to fuel the, just the underlying disgruntlement, more so in Abkhazia and then later on in South Ossetia. Um, yeah. Well, Abkhazia was its, was its own republic right. at the beginning. Yeah, so so right. I think exactly. at some point, Abkhazia was the official language. Yeah. Um, and then that was taken away, which I'm sure was not taken well by the Abkhaz. Um, and then when they, start on this follow -up, when they established uh, Abkhaz University, uh, they offer yes. Abhaz language instruction. Right. Do they offer other courses in Abhaz, or was most of the instruction in Russian? Um, I I believed that it was in Georgian. However, I'm Georgian. perhaps you an can error maybe here. Check it. I'm going yeah. to write this down <laughs> to find that out. should be checkable. Yeah. Checkable yeah. fact. <laughs> Thanks. Someone have a question over here? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I had a question. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I had a question about um, specifically how Georgians think about themselves, um, because um, there there is kind of a Georgian overall, um, you know, uh, republic and language and, and everything else, but there are different parts of Georgia, like there are Mingrelians, 
and there are others from other regions, and there's Ajaria, which is not on the map, but which was an independent territory for some time, but the Georgians were successful in preventing that from seceding. Right. So um, I'm wondering how now Georgians kind of think about themselves as being um, uh, all together, because there are differences between Georgians from different places, and is there, um, is there a way in which that kind of regionalism plays out? Um, is everybody buying into the idea of the Georgian nation that you've outlined, or are there differences of opinion kind of below the surface? Um, well, I imagine that there are differences of, of opinion, and that's not something I've gone into. However, I think that the outline that I set forth was um, kind of a, a generalized overall sentiment. Right. Um, and I would think that one of the uniting factors would be the orthodoxy in that case mm -hmm. for the various regions. Um, however, as to um, you know, like the preservation of Mingreli and Swan, etc., that I have to research further. I will talk about Oh, one, one quick thing. Ajarians are Muslim. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Thank you, Sophia. Um, can you say a little bit more about how far the politics of memory inform the Georgian national discourse? Yes. Mm. Um, okay, so um, that, I guess, my, my uh, first example would be the introduction of the idea that um, Georgians, that the Kartli, uh, is really the the only group that belongs to the land and to the region and that everyone else is just kind of a guest in their house and um, this idea of rewriting past history of like yes I mean they don't focus on the fact that other tribes have entered and you know they had to fight for the land just as other people had to or other groups had to fight for their territory however there's just kind of a narrow vision of um, we fought for this land and it's ours regardless of what has occurred in other tribes. Is that give you an How is it manifested today? Is it often brought up in speeches made by Georgian leaders? Um, it's reflected presumably in academic literature in Georgia. Yes, uh, um, uh, yes. and uh, manifestations of nationalism today, I'm certain, um, I would imagine with Margilashvili. However, that I cannot comment on at this point. But I'm gonna ask you one last question. What kind of relationship do the Abkhaz have with the South Ossetians? I mean, have they have they worked together? Have they coalesced, or have they always, you know, been fighting their own battles in terms of the battles with, you know, Tbilisi and, and the center? Well, I can speak to the eighties and nineties, mm -hmm. um, and so I know that they work together a little bit. Uh, well, from the nineties, mm -hmm. however, to present day. I am not sure of the situation in present day, um, but I know that they did feel some solidarity and common cause. Um, however, how far that goes and what the implications are of that in present day, I do need to research. Great. Well, I think we've given, you've had some great questions and comments here, so you'll have a little bit more time for more research, but uh, I look forward to reading your final paper. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>